Hey everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to look at rational functions and their graphs. So in this first video, we're going to look at how to find the domain of a rational function, how to use arrow notation, how to find vertical and horizontal asymptotes. In the next video, we'll look at how to graph rational functions and then solve applied problems that involve rational functions. So rational functions, we're going to look at the properties and their graphs in this section, which are quotients of polynomial functions. That's what rational functions are. And rational functions will be of this form. P of x divided by Q of x, where P of x and Q of x are polynomial functions. And the one restriction is that the denominator cannot be the zero polynomial. And... Let's assume that there are no common factors between the two polynomials. So in other words, after you have the numerator and denominator factored, there's no common factors. So to understand the behavior of the graph of a rational function, it is very useful to determine the domain. So since the rational function is a fraction of two polynomial functions, there may be some values of x where the denominator is zero. So let's review how to find the domain of a rational function. So number one, let's find the domain and write the answer using both interval notation and set builder notation. The opposite of x subtract 4 divided by x plus 5. So notice that the numerator and denominator are both polynomial functions. So f of x is a rational function. And if you remember from earlier in the course, we found out that if you have a fraction or a rational function for, the, for f of x, then the domain is the set of all x values except those that make the denominator zero. So x plus five cannot equal zero, or that means x cannot equal negative five. So let's write this using interval notation first. If the domain is the set of all real numbers except for negative 5, then the interval notation should be negative infinity to negative 5. That takes care of all the values of x that are less than negative 5. Union, and then negative 5 to infinity. And this will take care of all the values of x greater than negative 5. We've reviewed how to write interval notation in terms of domain, but we have not seen what's called set builder notation. Set builder notation is a convenient way to write all the x values that the input variable cannot assume. So we use curly brackets for the set notation. The variable is x, so this means the set of all x values. The vertical bar means such that, and the condition that x cannot assume is negative 5. So x cannot equal negative 5. So the way to read this set builder notation is x is a real number such that x can be anything except negative 5. Okay, so let's try a different problem. Number 2. Find the domain and write the answer using interval notation and set builder notation for g of x equals x subtract 4 divided by x squared subtract x subtract 2. So again, this is a rational function because the numerator and denominator are both polynomials. And that means it's a fraction, so we have to worry about division by zero. The domain will be the set of all x values, real numbers, such that x squared subtract x subtract 2 cannot equal zero. So this is a quadratic equation. That we need to solve which means we can try factoring and x subtract 2 x plus 1 is how this polynomial quadratic function will factor so this means x cannot equal 2 so if x was 2 the denominator will be 2 minus 2 and that's 0 so that'll make the denominator entirely 0 and x plus 1 cannot equal 0 which means x also cannot equal negative 1 so there are two values that x cannot assume. 
Otherwise, we would have division by zero. So let's write the domain using interval notation. So reading the a number line from left to right, you would have all the real numbers from negative infinity to negative one. You would have all the real numbers between negative one and positive two in the domain. And then you would have all real numbers greater than two. So make sure you have parentheses on negative one and parentheses on two because you want those omitted from the domain. And then set build notation actually is much more convenient to write. We only write what x cannot be. So set of all x values that are real numbers such that x cannot equal negative one, comma for the and x cannot equal two and then close the curly bracket for set. So this gives you an idea of how to find the domain of a rational function. Now we're going to talk about how do you graph a rational function and some of its characteristics. So even though rational functions are constructed from the graphs of polynomial functions, we have to be very careful about what x values will you divide by zero and pay special attention to the behavior of the graph near these values where the denominator is equal to zero. So this, we're going to start with a very basic rational function. This is called the reciprocal function and it's f of x equals one divided by x. So whatever value of x you substitute in, the y value will be the reciprocal of x. So notice that x cannot equal zero because that would put a zero in the denominator. So the domain are all real numbers except x cannot equal zero. So basically from the last example, we know that the set builder notation would be very easy to write x of all real numbers such that x cannot equal zero or interval notation would be negative infinity to zero and zero to infinity with the union between the two intervals. We're going to find out what is happening with the graph of one over x, one divided by x, whenever x is getting closer and closer to zero from either the left side or the right side. So let's look at what happens when you get closer and closer to x equals zero from the left for f of x equals one divided by x. There's only one excluded value, and let's find out what's happening on the left side. So let's make a table of values, and let's let x values get closer and closer to zero. So negative one on the left side of zero, then negative a half, negative one-tenth, negative one-hundredth, and then this is extremely close to zero, negative one-thousandth. Now, if we substitute, substitute these x values into the function, the reciprocal function, we find out that the reciprocal of negative one is negative one, the reciprocal of negative a half is negative two, and then negative 10, or negative one tenth is negative 10, and so on. Let's plot those values over here on the graph. So if you substitute a negative one, you get negative one. If you substitute a negative half, the reciprocal is negative two. And then if you substitute a negative one tenth, the reciprocal is negative 10. So what is happening to the y values or the output values as x is getting closer and closer to x equals zero? It looks like the y values are becoming more and more negative. And I can see that with the graph. The graph looks like it's going down very quickly as I get closer and closer to the y-axis. So this is what's called arrow notation. You can describe what is happening to the graph as x is getting closer and closer to zero from the left side. Then notice that the table of values decrease without bound. That means that the y values never approach a specific y value. They continue to grow and grow and grow and become more and more negative. That means f of x approaches negative infinity as x is approaching zero from the left. Now that's a lot to say and write. So this can be abbreviated with, with what's called arrow notation. So as x approaches zero from the left, 
that is as x the arrow means approaches zero and then there's a little minus sign as a superscript not an exponent but a superscript and the negative means you're approaching from the left side so x approaching zero from the left side f of x approaches negative infinity so the y values are growing without bound and they're growing towards the negative large values so the minus sign is a superscript and it means you're approaching from the left side so now we're going to approach x equals 0 from the right side of 0 using a table so notice that we're going to approach from the right side, so x equals 1, then a half, then 1 tenth, 1 hundredth, and then 1 thousandth. We're getting closer and closer to x equals 0. What I notice is that the y values, if I substitute those values into the function, they're growing without bound, but this time they're growing towards positive infinity. So 1 comma 1 is on the graph, then 0 0.5 comma 2 and then 0.1 comma 10. It looks like the values of y or f of x are growing without bound as I get closer and closer to zero from the right side. So let's summarize that with using error notation. So if x is approaching from the right, it looks like the table values increase without bound. And so f of x approaches positive infinity because the value the y values are growing without bound and they're increasing as x approaches zero from the right side so that can be abbreviated using arrow notation very similarly as we did with x approaching zero from the left so as x approaches zero from the right just as you might imagine if you're approaching from the left and it's a minus sign then approaching from the right it's a plus little plus sign so x is approaching zero from the right side the y values are approaching positive infinity. So that means the y values are growing without bound and the y values are increasing. So the plus sign means, in the superscript, means that you're approaching from the right side for the x values. Now we're going to find out what is happening to the y values as x gets further and further away from x equals 0, or the origin. So we're going to make, again, two tables. The table on the left is where x is increasing without bound. So x, we're going to start with x equals 1 again, then 10, then 100, and then 1,000. So if you substitute in these x values into the reciprocal function, the reciprocal of 1 is 1, reciprocal of 10 is 1 tenth, Reciprocal of 100 is 1 hundredth, and reciprocal of 1,000 is 1 divided by 1,000, or 1 thousandth. So that is what's happening as I get further and further away from the x, from the y-axis to the right. So 1 comma 1, if I plug in 10, I get 1 tenth. So it definitely looks like these y values are getting smaller and smaller and smaller as x is getting larger. So let's write that using words. If x increases without bound, that means x is increasing towards infinity. f of x is approaching the value y equals 0. So notice these y values are getting extremely small. It looks like the y values are getting close to zero. But no matter what x value I substitute in, I will never get zero. Not exactly zero. I will get a really small real number that's close to zero. So I'm approaching y equals zero, which is the x-axis. And on the other hand, let's look at what happens whenever x is decreasing without bound. So x is negative 1, the reciprocal is negative 1. If I substitute a negative 10, I get negative a tenth. If I substitute a negative 100, I'll get negative hundredth. Negative 1,000, I'll get negative 1,000th. 
So it looks like, again, if x is getting very large but negative, it's growing without bounds towards negative infinity, it looks like the y values are still getting closer and closer to zero. So x um, decreases without bounds. So x is approaching negative infinity. Notice that f of x is still approaching the value y equals zero, but never will get there for the same reason as before. So it's approaching the x-axis, but never will actually touch the x-axis. So we can actually use arrow notation to summarize this as well. So if f of x is approaching zero, we can use arrow notation. And if x is increasing or decreasing without bound, we can still use arrow notation. So if x is approaching infinity, so this means that your x values are increasing without bound. We notice that the y value, so f of x, is approaching 0. It won't actually get there, but it will approach y equals 0. And then if x is decreasing without bound, so x is approaching negative infinity, we also notice that the y values approach 0. So with these four different table of values in mind and the arrow notations, we can actually find out what the graph of the reciprocal function looks like. So this is the graph of f of x equals 1 divided by x. And this is called the reciprocal function. So why were we so concerned about x equals 0? Well, it's because the domain was the set of all real numbers except for zero. So any value less than zero, you will find a y value. Any value that's greater than zero for x, you will have a y value. So notice what's happening when we got closer and closer to x equals zero. We found out if the graph was increasing, or if the graph was approaching the y-axis from the right side, so the y-axis is x equals zero, it was the y values were growing without bound. So as x approaches 0 from the right side, f of x was growing without bound. But on the left side of x equals 0, we notice that if x is approaching 0 from the left, f of x was approaching negative infinity. So the y values decrease without bound. So that was the first two tables. We also found out if x is getting really large, then it looks like the y values were approaching zero. And same thing for x approaching negative infinity. x approaching negative infinity, f of x also approached zero. So this just summarizes everything we've learned about this graph. The graph is in quadrants one, in the top right corner of the coordinate system. And the graph is in quadrant three in the bottom left corner of the x and y axes. So now we're going to summarize the error notation. This graph was specifically interested in x approaching zero from the left and the right because that was the issue with the domain. But not all functions will have an x in the denominator and have an issue with x being zero. So you can approach x is approaching c from the right side. So if there's an issue with substituting in a value x equals c, then we'll be looking at the arrow notation x approaching c from the right, x approaching c from the left with a little minus sign. And then what happens when x is approaching infinity or x approaching negative infinity? Now let's move over to a different type of rational function. This is another basic rational function, but this one is 1 divided by x squared. So the only difference between the last function and this function is that we're dividing by x squared instead of dividing by x. So there's several things we can notice. If x is getting closer and closer to 0 from the right side, it looks like the graph is growing without bound. So the y values approach infinity. If x is approaching 0 from the left side, it looks like the graph is also 
growing without bound. So the y values still increase without bound towards infinity. And it looks like if x is made to be very large, so if x increases without bound, it looks like the y value still decreases zero. And if x is approaching negative infinity, the y values are still approaching the x-axis, which is y equals zero. So there are very similar common characteristics between these two graphs, except one divided by x squared, the graph is in quadrant one, and quadrant two in the top left corner of the x and y axes. So it looks like the graph is a getting really close to the y axis and it's getting really close to the x axis. These are called asymptotes. So we're going to talk about what's called vertical asymptotes of a rational function next. So in the case of these two basic functions, we notice that the curve approaches but does not touch the vertical line x equals 0, which was the y-axis. In this case, the y-axis or the vertical line x equals 0 is called a vertical asymptote. And it was a vertical asymptote for both f of x equals 1 divided by x and 1 divided by x squared. So a rational function, it may not have a vertical asymptote, but it also might have several vertical asymptotes. It depends on what values of x will make the denominator zero. So keep in mind as we go through the characteristics of a graph, the graph of a rational function will never touch or intersect a vertical asymptote. So this is the definition of a vertical asymptote. The line x equals c, and we know that vertical lines have the equation x equals a number, so this is a vertical line. It's a vertical asymptote of the graph of f of x if the y values increase or decrease without bound as x is approaching c. So we've noticed from these last two graphs that if x is getting closer and closer to c, and we usually denote vertical asymptotes with a dashed line, it's not part of the graph, so it's dashed. We notice that the graph can approach positive infinity from the left or positive infinity from the right of the asymptote. So if x is getting close to c from the right side, f of x is approaching infinity. And if x is approaching c from the left side, f of x is also approaching infinity. Anytime this happens, when the y values are growing without bound, then that must be a vertical asymptote at whatever x is approaching, x equals c. So this is a vertical asymptote, x equals c. But on the other hand, we've noticed also that at a vertical asymptote, the graph might be decreasing or increasing without bound. So on this second graph, if x is approaching c from the left, the y values are decreasing without bound towards negative infinity. But on the other side of the vertical asymptote, if x is approaching c from the right side, the y values are growing without bound. So this is what happens when you have vertical asymptotes. You might have the behavior go up on both sides, or they might be opposite. They might be going down on the left and up on the right, or they might be going up on the left and down on the right, or they might be going down on both ends. So we need to be very careful about what the behavior of the graph will be when we get closer and closer to a vertical asymptote. So now we're going to look at how do you find vertical asymptotes when you have a rational function p of x divided by q of x. Okay, keep in mind that these, keep in mind that the definition of a rational function, we assumed that p of x and q of x have no common factors. So let's say that if you substitute in x equals c and it makes the denominator zero, then that's going to be a vertical asymptote at x equals c. So example two, finding the vertical asymptotes of a rational function, simplify the rational functions to the lowest terms if they're not already, so that way they have no common factors. 
and then find the vertical asymptotes. So number one, find the vertical asymptotes for f of x equals x subtract 3 divided by x plus 5. So notice that this is a rational function. The numerator and denominator are both polynomials. And notice that I cannot factor the numerator any further, nor the denominator. So this is in lowest terms. So if this functions in lowest terms, that means whatever makes the denominator zero is a vertical asymptote. So x plus five equals zero gives me x equals negative five. So take the denominator after the functions in lowest terms, set equal to zero, and I find out that x equals negative five. This is a vertical asymptote in the function's graph. So how does this relate with domain? Well, domain, we want to worry about what will make the denominator, the denominator not equal to zero. So x cannot equal negative five. And we wrote this in interval notation as negative infinity to negative five and negative five to infinity. So there is a connection between the domain and, and vertical asymptotes. If the function is already in lowest terms, whatever makes the denominator zero, that's a vertical asymptote. But that also tells us that we cannot have that value plugged into the denominator because I will not touch or cross a vertical asymptote. So there is no point at x equals negative five. So let's try another problem, number two. Find the vertical asymptotes of g of x, x subtract 5 divided by x squared subtract 5x plus 6. So again, this is a rational function. And notice that the numerator is in, lo is in lowest terms. The denominator, let's see if we can factor that. x squared minus 5x plus 6, that factors as x subtract 2 and x subtract 3. Two numbers that multiply to 6, and the same two factors add to negative 5. So I notice that the numerator and denominator have no common factors. So this function is already in lowest terms. So take the denominator which we already have, and we factored it, set it equal to zero. Whatever makes the denominator zero, once the function is in lowest terms, is a vertical asymptote. So x minus two equals zero, or x minus three equals zero. So x equals two, x equals three. These are both vertical asymptotes for the function's graph. So keep in mind, vertical asymptotes, there could be several of them for a rational function. It's whatever makes the, the denominator zero once it's been simplified, the function. So how does this relate with domain? So domain was, so x minus two times x plus three cannot equal zero. That's what is the denominator. It cannot be equal to zero for a rational function. And I notice that x cannot equal two and x cannot equal negative 3, which means using interval notation, the function's domain would be negative infinity to negative 3, negative 3 to 2, and 2 to infinity. So it looks like wherever I had a vertical asymptote, those were also issues with the domain. Okay, so now the last thing we're going to talk about in this first video is now that we know how to find vertical asymptotes, how do you find horizontal asymptotes? So we need to talk about what horizontal asymptotes are. In our two basic function graphs, 
1 divided by x and 1 divided by x squared, it looked like the y values were approaching a value y equals 0 whenever x increased or decreased without bound. So that's what was happening at the far left end and the far right end of the graph. It looked like the values were getting closer and closer to the x-axis. So the line y equals 0 is a horizontal line because it's the equation y equals a number. It's the x-axis and that is called a horizontal asymptote because the y values are approaching the x-axis or y equals 0 but never actually gets there. So the definition of a horizontal asymptote, the line y equals l L is just a real number, is called a horizontal asymptote for the graph of a function. If the y values approach this number L, and L is the y value, if x is increasing or decreasing without bound. So let's look at the two graphs. If x is increasing without bound, so if x is going towards infinity, it looks like the y values are getting closer and closer to this imaginary line y equals l. So f of x is approaching l. And this is called a horizontal asymptote. Or we're going to abbreviate it ha. So ha is y equals l. On the other hand, if x is decreasing without bound, so x is going towards negative infinity, it looks like the graph is, this graph is going towards also y equals l. So f of x is approaching l as well. So that means I have a horizontal asymptote y equals l. Now the one difference between horizontal asymptotes and vertical asymptotes. We could never cross or touch a vertical asymptote. You can, so we never intersect a vertical asymptote, a graph may cross a horizontal asymptote. Okay, so the graph may cross a horizontal asymptote somewhere in the interior of the function, towards the middle. But a horizontal asymptote is what's concerning with the graph on the ends. If the graph is leveling out at the end of the graph, but it might cross somewhere be before the ends of the graph. The other difference is that you can have several vertical asymptotes, but with a graph of a rational function, you can have at most one horizontal asymptote. At most one. So how do you locate horizontal asymptotes without graphing? So this one's a little bit more complicated than finding vertical asymptotes. Suppose that f of x is a rational function, and let's say the function is written out as a polynomial divided by a polynomial. So we've seen polynomials written this way in the previous videos. a sub n, x to the n, plus a sub n minus 1, x to the n minus 1, all the way down to the constant term, a sub 0. And let's say the denominator has different coefficients, b sub m, x to the different power, m b sub m minus 1, x to the m minus 1. So again, the coefficient subscript matches the power of x on that term, all the way down to the constant term. So it's important that we write out what the polynomial looks like in the numerator and denominator because we need to look at the degree of the numerator, which is n, and the degree of the denominator, which is m. That determines whether what type of horizontal asymptote we have. So there's three different cases. Case number one, if n is less than m, that means degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. The x-axis, or y equals zero, is the horizontal asymptote. So if the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, then the horizontal asymptote is the x-axis, y equals zero. If the degrees are the same, n equals m in the numerator and denominator, then y equals 
A sub N divided by B sub M is the horizontal asymptote. So what does this mean? It means A sub N was the leading coefficient of the numerator, and B sub M was the leading coefficient of the denominator. So if the degrees are the same, the Y, the horizontal asymptote, is the fraction of the leading coefficients. If the degrees are the same. And then finally, if the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator, so if n is greater than m, you will not have a horizontal asymptote. None exist. All right, so let's finish up with an example on how do you find horizontal asymptotes. So number one, find the horizontal asymptote, if any, for the graph of the following rational functions. So we're going to do three because we have three different cases that could possibly happen. So let's say f of x is negative 3x cubed plus 7x subtract 2 divided by 5x to the fourth minus 3x plus 7. So I'm finding the horizontal asymptotes. It's what happens whenever x is approaching infinity or x approaching negative infinity. I need to look at the degree of the numerator. Notice that the degree of the numerator is 3. But the degree of the denominator is 4. So this is the first case. If the denominator has the larger power of x, or has a larger degree, then the horizontal asymptote is y equals 0, the x-axis. So the y values will approach 0 as you go to the far left end and the far right end of the graph. Number 2. Let's say the function is g of x. 1 subtract 3x cubed plus 4x to the fourth divided by 2x cubed subtract 5x squared plus 6x to the fourth. So I notice that I have degree 4 in the numerator. And also in the denominator is also degree 4. So if the degrees are the same, then we're looking at case number 2. And the horizontal asymptote is the fraction or ratio of the leading coefficients. So horizontal asymptotes are always y equals. It looks like here are my leading terms. 4x to the 4th and 6x to the 4th. So I already determined that the degrees are the same. The leading coefficients gives me the horizontal asymptote. So reduce the lowest terms. It looks like y is approaching 2 thirds as I get x is approaching infinity or as x approaches negative infinity. And then the last case, let's say the function is negative 2x cubed plus 5x squared subtract 7x plus 11 divided by 4x squared minus 16x plus 8. So again, we're trying to find the horizontal asymptote. We need to compare the degrees of the numerator and denominator. The numerator has degree 3, and the denominator has degree 2. And then in this case, if the numerator has the larger power of x, if the, if the numerator has the larger degree, then there is no horizontal asymptote for the function. So that means as x is approaching infinity or as x approaches negative infinity, the y values do not approach any specific number. They do not level out towards a horizontal asymptote on either end of the graph. So this is a good place to stop.
In the next video, we're going to look at graphing rational functions. So if you have any questions about how to find the domain of a rational function or vertical or horizontal asymptotes, please let me know. And if you have any questions while you work on the homework, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we start graphing.